chatting, Ty, we're chatting cold exposure. You said that you were, you've gotten a little more into the Wim Hof breathing, cold exposure. Like what's your, what's your routine there? Okay. So it kind of started odd, oddly, I guess. Um, I was in Aspen with a couple of the boys and Sheldon was uh, the gentleman who, you know, just an amazing dude brought us down and stuff. And that was my first. So he's got a couple cold tubs outside, like couple, like 10 cold tubs, old, like, you know, cow troughs, I guess. Yeah. Is that, yeah. And, I think those um, are the ones, those are like the old school ones they use in like the locker rooms on the road and stuff. Oh, those might the be best. old school cold. I don't know. Yeah. But they do look like horse troughs. So he looks at me and he's like, uh, do you want to do a cold tub? And I was like, no, like I actually, I don't. <laughs> I was like, I've honestly never done a cold tub. And he's like, come on, man, like, let's do it. Like we were waiting for a flight. So we were kind of, you know, in limbo and he's got a, you know, beautiful place. He's got options, he's got the hot tub and everything. So he's like, I want to take you through my morning routine. And I was like, I don't know, man, like, okay, yeah, like, I guess I could do it. So as soon as I get down to my swim trunks, I'm trembling. I'm shaking. I'm like, this is, I, I had a high ankle sprain in junior and I had a hard time putting my foot in an ice bath, let alone my whole body. But I'm like, you know what, if I like, I need to start doing stuff like this. Like I need to, I need to start being proactive. You know, body's been through a lot already. I'm like, I got, I got to do this. So get outside and wow, it was freezing to begin with. And he's like, don't even think about it. Just do it. So I hop in I, and I just go like ready to go. And he instantly was like breathing, 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 breathing. Like he's like, you need to get your breath under control. He's like, as soon as you get your breath under control, it's like the cold is not like a feeling. It's almost like a, what did he say? I think he said like, it's a sensation. Mm-hmm. Like it's more like, you know, once you, you, once you get it, to that, kind of? yeah. Like yeah. once you get to that place and your breathing's under control, like the cold water isn't actually that cold anymore mm-hmm. and i'm thinking in my head i'm like what, what are you talking about? so i get in and i do the <laughs> for like 15 seconds and then after probably 30 seconds i got my breathing under control like just mm-hmm. long deep breaths in and we get out of the hot tub i think i did like probably two minutes get out of the hot tub we go and <laughs> jump off of his diving board into his pool and then we go into the hot tub and then we go into the steam shower mm-hmm. i know what a morning routine were you but, burning like was your skin burning once you went into the hot no, the cra- like, that, the crazy part, man. Like, no, like mm-hmm. it was so refreshing. Yeah. Like I. Uh, so now, and then my buddy who I played in humble with Grayson, um, he is like, he's like, this has changed my life. Mm-hmm. I saw him last week, and he's like, I wake up every day, and <laughs> funny thing is, he's like, yeah, you know, I wake up and I go have a pee, and then I come back and get cozy in bed, <laughs> and uh, and he's like. I do 10 rounds of this Wim Hof breathing method and he's explaining how it's a lot, dude. Mm -hmm. Like he's like, but he's like, it's 15 minutes out of my day. Yeah. He's like, I do 10 rounds of it. And he was explaining like the science behind it and how it's like getting more and more oxygen to like the areas of your, you know, brain and stuff that normally wouldn't start your day with that much oxygen. And he, he honestly explained like after you do like 10 rounds, it's honestly like you're, you feel high. Like you Mm -hmm. feel like you have so much oxygen that you almost feel like not stone, but like just like high. Mm -hmm. And then he's like, I jump into the shower. I start with warm and then he'll just like finish with like two minutes of cold and do two more breathing methods while the cold is coming. And I'm like, wow, like that is devotion, man. Like that is commitment. So I'm not there yet, but I will say I've started to implement a little bit about the breathing I've started to implement a little bit about the cold exposure, like just finish, you know, finishing your shower with like a minute and a half, two minutes of just cold. Mm -hmm. So Uh, I don't know, like it's, it's, yeah, I don't know. That podcast that I was talking about, Rogan and uh, Andrew Huberman, he's, you know, Huberman, he's like, yeah, I think he's a Huberman lab. Yeah. Neurologist. He's a professor at Stanford, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, But they just say, I think he says five times a week, if you can, Go 30 seconds, finish your shower with as cold as you can five times a week. And then if you have access to do one, he maybe even said one, he usually starts like pretty like low level that's like accessible for people and that's realistic for people. I think he said one cold tub. If you can do like a three minute cold tub up to your neck just once a week, 
the effects that that has on your psychological, um, your ability to cope with stress. I mean, I think I, I'm talking like I know what I'm saying, but just what I've heard is like everybody used to think cold tubs was just for like inflammation and performance. And, you know, you take it after a game to get your legs to not be as sore or whatever. But now just the the psychological benefits, like up there with like antidepressant, like rivaling the, the effects, rivaling like what a Zoloft or a SSRI or something would do, you know? And it's not like like antidepressants can be just, they, they, they sort of make you feel better momentarily, right? For like 15 hours or whatever the life is. These like can kind of kick you into that system where you're starting to, I don't know, feel better yeah, because even like brown fat i think it reduces yeah. your brown fat and like yeah. yeah even grayson was telling me all about the i wish i could have recorded him just because like he's like fully dived into it mm-hmm. and um it is pretty incredible to think that everybody can have access to this in some respects <laughs> but like it's so hard to do because yeah. it's it's purely mental like especially the cold aspect of it like it's just purely mental the breathing is like, you know, the breathing's good. Like it's, everybody can do it. Like it's quick, it's easy, but it's also, I was having this conversation, like it's so hard because it's, it takes time for the, for you to, I don't know if you feel the effects, see the effects. Like, it's not like you have like concrete, you know, day five, yeah. this, this happened day six, this happened. Like, it's more like, just like, I think over time you start to just have that more energy, that more awareness that I don't know. And like Mm -hmm. you said it perfectly, like the psychological benefits is huge. Like, and it's something that, you know, hopefully can make people heal more naturally, even though don't get me wrong, like SSRIs and like medication is it's good. Like I, 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 I'm glad that obviously that is a great option for a lot of people. But I also know that, you know, to some respects, those options may not work for everybody. So, I mean, having an option that's like natural, that's mm-hmm. quick, you can start your day with it. We'll see. I don't know. Like, yeah. it'd be interesting no, to know I if agree. like pro- professional athletes are into it. Oh, yeah. It's big. It, it's hard, though, man. Like you said it, like, I feel like people that bash it and say like, oh, no, like, it's not not worth it. And they talk about this on the podcast because like, they're the people that just really struggle getting in, you know, Oh, yeah. it's, a, it's a thing that like people just really try to avoid like it's it's really like scary like getting into it's frightening tub, yeah like it's not a good feeling but when you get out like three minutes really like it seems like a long time but what i do especially when i when i don't feel like doing it which apparently it's the best benefit is when you're not feeling like you want to do it and you're like avoiding it and you're just going to say ah, i'm not going to do it today that's the best time you should be doing it yeah. Um, yeah. I just bring in a song I know is three minutes long. So I'll bring my phone in, I'll put on the song and I'll just sort of sit there and like vibe to the song. And once the song's done, I get out and it helps pass the time for that, that three minutes. Cause then you end up kind of forgetting about the, about the, well, what, you can't glance over the song. Is it TikTok by Kesha? Is it like party in the USA, <laughs> Miley Cyrus? Like what's the song? <laughs> what was my last, my last one I did was uh quitting time by uh zach Bryan, yeah, which i yeah. thought was like a good play on words like i could just quit like you know i, I don't have yeah. to do this i could just quit but see yeah, i feel like i would quit. need yeah. something like upbeat yeah like or, quitting time or, is like or really okay. soft because then you're just like all right just like yeah zen out a little but yeah do i, I need to start my day with i'm trying to and i think it's uh it's coming it's it's a process and realistically it's so easy to roll over grab your phone and start surfing the web already yeah but if like take the time like it's 10 minutes and like i yeah it's just it's just getting over that initial hump and like once it's in your routine i feel like it's just like a part of you but like actually making it a part of your routine is like i don't know and i mean i i wouldn't say like i'm a routine guy but in some respects like you know i don't have a nine to five so it's hard Mm -hmm. to like fully engulf myself in a routine sometimes like Mm -hmm. you know i'm flying to regina tonight like it's not like i'm waking up in my bed tomorrow and like you know just like you know it's so it's off and on but it's just once again like it's just like a purely i need to just like put myself in that space and like just like take action and i don't know you feel accomplished after two i got another one for you this is kind of similar, um, similar topic. And this was something that Dan and I 
obviously, you know, Dan, like mm-hmm. our life yeah. coach, we were just talking about like the way the brain works and like waking up in the morning for me, like sometimes I have trouble waking up in the morning, trying to like wake up a little earlier to be with Keisha and Slater and to have some time before I go to the rink. But sometimes it, it's easy to just hit the snooze button and go back to sleep and wake up at that last possible minute that will give you enough time to, to start your day. Yeah. So what what we did was like, we're going to call it instinct day and just do it one day. You call it instinct day. I took a picture of it. I wrote it on a piece of paper. I took a picture of it. Whoa. So it's the first thing I, first thing I look at um, on my phone, but really just the idea is right away, look at it and just be like, okay, follow your instinct. Like what your first instinct is when you wake up, you hear yeah. your alarm. Your first instinct is, okay, get out of bed. Yeah. And that's what, that's what you should, that's what I'm going to listen to. So then huh. when I come downstairs and Keisha and Slater are here and they're watching TV and then I go like grab a coffee, sit on the couch, I look at my phone and I'm like, okay, pull up Instagram or pull up whatever, pull up email, look at my text. Yeah. But then I see instinct day. It's like, okay, well, is that what I should be doing? Should I be more present? Should I be hanging out with them, talking with them? And then kind of maybe give myself some time before I check my phone. And usually like what he was kind of telling me, like, your initial instinct, it's the same thing as like what your gut feeling is. That's usually yeah. that's usually the right thing to do, right? When you, I don't know, like for, for an example, like when you talk about like working out, when you want to go work out, usually it's like, okay, I'm going to go do this. I'm going to go do this. But then a lot of the times you end up cutting workout short or you come up with an excuse in your own head saying, you don't have enough time, whatever. But it's that initial instinct is usually the right thing to do. And usually you should have the time to do it if you actually follow that gut feeling so that's what we got into and it, and it's helping me i'm not saying i follow it every single time i think of something mm-hmm. i do it but it does give you that little bit of a kick in the ass to like it reminds you of what you really want to be doing and and then when you do those things it is satisfying wow that is so simple i've never thought about like even like realistically i could make a background it says 10 round five rounds of breathing cold tub or like cold <laughs> exposure and just like that's the first thing you see that's so interesting you know what thank yeah. you dan yeah, yeah yeah okay he's got a lot of the, um uh, yeah no kidding um but anyways for our listeners for our, our lovely community um riley and i just wanted to hop on you know check in and uh and talk about you know what's life been like lately and uh and what we're feeling and you know music whatever we're just gonna we're just gonna chat and you guys are along for the ride whether you like it or not so um i know we wanted to chat about morgan wallen and his new album and sobriety and how much he's talking about sobriety so obviously i think for some people morgan wallen is still kind of a you know in some respects a problematic individual from his past you know what he what he said and and how he's you know in some way, like Morgan Wallen is, he's, I don't know, like, it's interesting, because now you're seeing him put out an album that is very focused on sobriety and very focused on, you know, that lifestyle, um, the country lifestyle, the born with a beer in my hand, the all this, but it's interesting, because he has made mistakes in the past. And he has, you know, suffered the, the, the consequences from his actions and from his words. And, um, by no means are we condoning, you know, what happened with him in the past, but it is, I would like to hear your perspective on the album. Cause I know, I mean, I love music, but I know you're definitely a, a lyrical guy. I know you like to, you know, understand the lyrics and I know you like to, you know, dive into it a little bit deeper. So first kind of initial thoughts for yourself. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I'm, I'm not a huge country guy. I, I, I love country in the summertime. So kind of when the weather starts to get nice and summer's approaching, I'll start to throw throw some songs on. And I really got into Zach Bryan and Morgan Wallen. Like I like kind of just disregarded him after all that stuff came out. Uh, I think it was in like 2021. But then like people kept talking about his new album. And then I saw like, it's like 30, how many songs? It's like 36 songs or something. And I think they were all on the top 100. So I was like, I, I top 100 billboard charts or whatever. Um, so I was like, I, I got to take a listen. And then I started listening to it and I'm like, shit, like he's storytelling so well and he's opening up so much. And then I was like, we're like 
just thinking like how hard you like we as a society are on people who do screw up and and obviously there's screw up and there's like just total fuck up like when you're doing Mm -hmm. things that are absolutely unforgivable yeah but like just looking back on kind of how he retraced his steps and how he got better and how he kept his name out of any sort of negative spotlight and then I think I read that he like he did some work with some musical charity group with with the black community and all these things and then he comes out with this album and I actually like I kind of like could almost like resonate with it a bit like relate to it a bit because even for me like just going through some struggles when I first came and started playing for hockey obviously it's at a different scale he's he's a lot more famous than, than me but like just that idea of like just trying to put your one foot in front of the other and just try to like get people's trust back and try to like make a good example of yourself and then like people forgive you if you do the right things and people like your true character comes out i mean i think in that life and in, in, in most people's lives as they grow up there's so much pressure to do the right thing all the time and then when you have cameras on you and people like breathing down your neck you don't you don't get a second chance so it's cool to see him getting that that second chance and then yeah some of the born with a beer in my hands great song i mean the one that i put on tune tuesday the the song to his mom i sent that one to my mom even when i i gave her the shout out on tune tuesday she she really liked that because we definitely had a few hiccups when i was younger so i just think it's really cool and like his the way that he mixes it with sports too he's got a few songs on there like 98 Braves. 98 braves oh god yeah. that's so good yeah it just really like caught me because because uh, one, it's so good, so catchy, but also like, fuck, he's been through the ringer. Obviously, he did something really stupid and and whatnot, but like, he's done a really good job at earning a second chance and and doing some good with it. So I don't, know. yeah, yeah, I just think it's really good. Yeah, I, I mean, I loved hearing your thoughts. I don't have a t- like, I uh, I still need to immerse myself in the album. I just saw that Luke Combs had a new album, so I've been I've been bumping to some Combs. Um, yeah. but yeah, as for Morgan. I respect the path he's taken and especially like making this step and like making it or taking it upon himself to, you know, not just put it on out an album, but put out something with meaning and put out something Mm -hmm. that a lot of people can relate to. I think that's something that, you know, I think we'll, we're seeing that more and more with artists. Like even, um, I can't remember who it was. My girlfriend just cat has been bumping an album lately and it's, I don't know anyways, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's same thing, like sobriety is something that a lot of people think about and a lot of people I think can relate to and the way he kind of goes around it and the way he, you know, talks about the fact that like his lifestyle was pretty much you're born with a beer in Mm -hmm. your hand and and all that. And then being able to like kind of overcome that and, you know, get into that space and, and touch on a topic that, you know, maybe country music doesn't focus on a ton just because it is beer whiskey friends and you know a lot of those topics so i mean good for him i I, at the end of the day what he did um a while back is you know that is something that he will always be somewhat attached with and i'm you know i think we can be proud of the work he's done i think it's not ever going to end like i think it's still you know he's still going to take these steps and he's still got to you know work on the, the language he uses and the understanding and the you know, just that whole foundation. But yeah, it, it's uh, 36 songs. <laughs> it's it's insane. It's crazy. <laughs> like, it's crazy. I have so much respect for songwriters and, and artists and like the fact that he just bumped out a 36 song album about, you know, pretty heavy about sobriety is uh, it's commendable. It's um, it's going to be a summer jam for a lot of people. Oh, yeah. And I don't know. It's uh, Luke Combs said it perfectly. He said, the moment he really started to realize that his fans were his fans was when he started hearing his songs on boats. And I was like, whoa, like I've never thought about that. But he was like, you know, like I've been on a red light with a guy bump into my music. But like when you're in the dead of summer on a hot day and you're with your people on a boat and you're listening to his songs, he was like, that was the moment where I just like knew that like, okay, like I've, I'm kind of doing this. <laughs> and I was like, that's you know what? That's so, so cool. true. <laughs> that's gotta be so cool. It's funny though, like with just music in general, like I remember even talking with Jeff um, Levecchio about like what you absorb, like what you listen to, what you watch, like it does play a role in, 
and sometimes like what you think about and like whatever, like your brain does pick up on it. And it's funny when a guy comes out with an album like this, like people gravitate to it. Like they really like relate to it. I think about like, I was talking uh, to someone the other day about like hip hop and like how it's like just stereotypical rap about like money, girls, drugs, whatever. But then when like J. Cole comes out with an album that's like so lyrical and like deep and like, or like Mac relatable. Miller. Yeah, like Mac like... Miller, even Eminem stuff. Like when he was like, yeah. And he would come up with stuff that was just like more in depth about your feelings. Obviously, some of the stuff is just like not relatable at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but like then everyone's like everybody like collectively gravitates to it. So it just kind of shows that like community can be brought together by like deepness and like vulnerability, you know, like it's just kind of sometimes hard to get everybody on that same page. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, I will forever. I think I'm going to mount joy at red rocks in august nice so i saw lumineers at budweiser stage and i think that's number one right now but mount joy at red rocks is probably gonna like trump anything um, yeah I, like lumineers like you, might be the better band to see but mount joy at red rocks is you know i don't you want to come red rocks from what i've heard is is one of the you want to come you asking me to go when is it yeah I know the uh, lead singer too, so maybe we do a Speak Your Mind episode from the depths of Red no Rocks. <laughs> way. If we did, I'd, yeah, hundred percent. I would. August, I'd be there. Uh, August seventeenth and eighteenth. I don't know. Well, you I got mean, a wedding? No, I'll be. I would be back here if I were to come back to Switzerland. I would be back here. But, oh, okay. All but right. if not, I would definitely try to work that out because that would be unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. It's uh, hey, our uh, side note. Are the uh, the uh, train uh, employees still on strike out in Europe? I don't know. We, I, I don't. I'm not in the loop anymore after they screwed our trip to Paris. So. <laughs> oh, but that's cut, funny. The lady was it's so refreshing to work with. That the lady that we were going to Airbnb her place in Paris. Yeah, she could have easily hosed me for all my money because the cancellation policy said you have to cancel within like yeah. a week or whatever. But this all happened the day before we were supposed to go. The, the train's being canceled, but she re- reimbursed us fully. And like it was, it was complicated because Airbnb doesn't really make it that easy if you break the cancellation policy. So we had to like navigate through customer service and all these things. And oh, she geez. full refund, and it was amazing, really refreshing to work with someone like that because she could have easily walked away with with our money full price so that was nice yeah 100 percent. yeah what are you uh um, regina, what are you doing uh, is regina is that interesting or is i got a canadian mental health association youth summit that i'll be speaking at tomorrow so it's uh it's kind nice. of a full day thing i think there's going to be 400 um, students probably grade seven and up um, nice so yeah you youth is always something i think it's spring break right now so i'm not sure i don't know if it's spring break in saskatchewan but uh youth is definitely um it's interesting because I love chatting with adults. Like I love chatting. Like I just did a speech at a big oil and gas company here and it was, you know, 25 to 55 year olds, male and females in a very, you know, a a space that isn't usually attached with mental health and usually attached with suicide prevention. But I mean, being able to do this speech, it was crazy. Like I, I had a guy in the front row who was, you know, covered in tattoos, looked like he was like he could crush my skull with his two hands. But I mean, he was in tears. And I'm like, this is like, it's so hard because I, I hate making people cry. Because but then again, it's like, this is this is exactly what it's all about. Like this guy yeah. is, you know, the epitome of a he looks like the epitome of an oil and gas guy, you know, tattoo and everything. But he was so, you know, touched and so Mm -hmm. came up to me afterwards introduced himself we had a little chat and like i mean once again it's just like that classic i instantly kind of painted a picture of you know how this guy is going to be but he sat front row by himself and was like i mean we didn't like he probably didn't stop making eye contact in like my direction like the whole time like it's just Mm -hmm. it is fascinating to be able to experience that and to be able to you know see the fact that my words and what I've learned is deeply affecting and bringing out some emotions on this Monday afternoon Mm -hmm. with this gentleman in front of me. So 
That's so Regina awesome. would be good. Um, I still love, you know, speaking to the youth because I think it's so important to, you know, get those messages flowing at an early age. It's, uh, you know, it's tough at time because youth, I think we all have short attention spans. So, I mean, it's, uh, it's, de- <laughs> it's definitely. Dude, uh, yeah. <laughs> my note, my notes here about like poss- like things that maybe it could be cool to touch on. That one title is attention span. <laughs> I was just like it, thinking about how I could loop it in, and then you just said attention span. And I was like, "Oh, perfect." Okay, so let's talk about it. No, I was—I didn't mean to cut you off, but I think it's—it's it's a very important group of people to talk about or talk to right now. You know, especially mm-hmm. about about mental health. So I'm glad you're doing that. But no, <laughs> I just—I get this newsletter, the Blinkist. It's called. It's like. Okay. I don't even, it just comes to me. Honestly, I forgot about what, what it was. I don't even know what it is for, but I, I saw it come up in my email and the subject was um, talking about how our average, like our attention span, the number of like seconds or minutes, whatever, how much it's gone down. I think the last time they, they measured, it was like 2004 and they said our attention span, our average attention span was two and a half minutes approximately. So whatever. I don't even know what, what that means. But then they said 2021 surveys showed um, like 47 seconds. Oh, so, so then they just, they talk about like, they attribute it to TikTok and Instagram. And then I kind of got caught in the rabbit hole of like seeing these crazy stats about what these apps do to our brains. And then that's why I came up on the, there's like a, a bunch of school counties and districts that are suing these big social media companies facebook or meta instagram snapchat youtube tiktok for playing the role of like degrading these kids mental health and causing these oh my problems <laughs> and so like they're they're really like i think the words causing mental health issues blaming them for distracted students cyberbullying and worse so they just want these companies to hold but they want to hold the companies accountable but they I've read about this thing called the devious lick challenge. Did you ever hear about that? No. It was like a whole like stealing and vandalizing school property and then posting about it. And it's like just a like tie pod, tie pod challenge. Millions. Yeah. Just something like that. But it involved just vandalizing and, and school, like damaging school property and then taking pictures of it and boasting about it by tagging devious lick challenge. So I just like, I, I couldn't get over it. And then I saw like all these stats, like, 40% of Gen Z spend more than three hours on TikTok a day. 90% will binge the feed for over an hour of time. And then on top, like 54% of those people claim they're depressed. So it's like, wow, you have these people like spending this much amount of time on TikTok, but then they're saying they're depressed and they know they're depressed. Like there's the polls were saying these people like saying, yeah, I'm, I'm depressed because of this, but Wow. I just thought that was crazy. And then like they start talking about the science of the brain, like the, the part of the brain that um, controls like memory or attention span or impulse yeah. control, like that's not fully developed until you're 25. But I think 40% of the TikTok users are 18 to 25 years old. So I don't know, just it was really scary, especially with a kid, you start to think of these things a little more. So I'm glad you wow. brought up attention span. That is profound, man. I had, uh, I mean, yeah, it's, I think at the end of the day, it's just so hard to like be complacent in your, in your current space mm-hmm. just because, I mean, I did it. I think it's just like, it's nice to have somebody guide you, but a lot of these little practices and, you know, mechanisms that you can implement in your life are, it's just you. Like it's, you know, it's not like, you know, I mean, couples therapy and everything, but when you're wanting to go to therapy, like it's you in that room. And when you want to do the breathing, it's you like, it's not Mm -hmm. like, you know, don't get me wrong. It'd be nice to have somebody kind of guide you along, especially in kind of the spaces where you're not super comfortable, Mm -hmm. but yeah, it's, it's completely you're doing. And as much as having that support system and having the people that, you know, love you be around they can only do so much in a lot of aspects. And it's pretty profound because I've had a lot of conversations with people, you know, after my speaking engagements about how it was just that there were, there's those moments where it's just, I need to do something and I need Mm -hmm. to act and I need to, cause I'm just going to start losing my people and I'm going to start 
creating these consequences in my life that yeah I, wow yeah i had no idea yeah, yeah it it's creates just, such it, a dis- it creates such a distraction for those moments right like when exactly. you when you do have those aha moments where you're like hey i need to figure shit out like it's hard enough to stay consistent with those just as a human but then when you have like this feeling you're missing out on something because you're not checking your instagram and i have it i spend oh, yeah. too much i spend too much time on instagram i, I know I do. i'm not really a tiktok person but yeah you just have like the, the way like the algorithm they use or like the way they they the way they do it they're obviously really smart but they make you feel like you're missing out on something and then you end up going and scrolling and you're like what i'm not there's nothing that just helped me there i just lost like, an hour of my life <laughs> i know it's crazy <laughs> It's kind of like it goes back to Borokop. Like it's just it's just get to rather than have to. Like it's kind mm-hmm. of being able to look at these these challenges in a in a different perspective and and seeing the light at the start rather than waiting and going through the process and then finding that light. Um, yeah, I think it can kind of relate to just like the way you look at these challenges and the way you look at these obstacles. But yeah, mm-hmm. wow, that's uh, whew, geez, that's scary a little bit. Yeah, no, it's it's not a. And then a little side note on that, because Keisha and I were talking about this last night as she was watching Vanderpump Rules. And oh, my wa- God. Dude. <laughs> and, and I was watching. <laughs> have you seen Mayor of Kingstown? Whoa, this is freaky, man. OK, so I can I started Mayor of Kingstown last night, but then. I was just chatting with Kat before I came upstairs and I was like, is there any pop culture drama? And she's like, well, you could always talk about Vanderpump Rules because she's no been trying way. to explain to me this Vanderpump Rules situation. And it is, there's a lot of layers. Like we we touched on the whole Selena Haley situation. I feel like that's not one dimensional, but now like this Vanderpump thing, there is so many layers. This, yeah. the, the restaurant space and the, the, I don't even know where to begin. Yeah, no, I mean, I couldn't, sorry, not last, I wasn't watching uh, Kingstown last night. I was watching our game last night um, and she was watching Vanderpump Rules. So I could hear what was going on. (laughs) And I just noticed my eyes kept creeping over to her screen. And I'm like, what is this? Like you're a 31 year old like woman, like mom, and and you have control over your life and emotions and and you're not going to be like manipulated by these people. But like little like girls that are like she said it's rated 14 plus i'm like girls that are watching this like this is just like this is prime bullying and prime <laughs> alcohol abuse like yeah I, i'm not like obviously like you some of it's okay and some of that like whatever but like it was just insane i was like this is crazy that this is like tv that's and it's popular. it's big big drama like i couldn't yeah. believe like you know i i never I mean, cat watched the Hills and Vanderpump rules and all that growing up. But like, I didn't watch that shit. And now uh-huh. like there's TikToks of people explaining what's going on because there's so many, there's so many out- situations involved. In- yeah. It's uh wow. It's I'm glad crazy. you, but yeah, I just started America Kingstown and it's uh Good, that eh? first episode rocked me. That first episode when I was, whoa, I can't, I can't spoil it, but my gosh, I love, uh, I love what's his name from Friday Night Lights. The uh, Coach Taylor. Yeah, I love Coach Taylor. And then I don't know his yeah, name. I know, I, know the door. I know Jeremy Renner, obviously, but I don't yeah. know Coach Taylor. Um, if I saw him in real life, I'd probably call him Coach Taylor. Have to. I, I if I saw like Tim Riggins, if I saw him in real life, I'm calling him Tim Riggins. I'm not calling yeah. him uh, Taylor Kitsch. <laughs> yeah, like Emilio Estevez is probably Coach Bombay. <laughs> You know? Okay. Anyways, um, yeah, I wanted to touch on. Uh, I think this episode will be releasing on April seventh, twenty eighteen, which is uh, a very important day as well. That's uh, Green Shirt Day for organ donation, the Logan Boulay effect. Um, the Boulays have continued to do such amazing work in this space with organ donation and being able to, you know, connect with people who have received organs from another from a donor and. Um, but obviously the day before that, April 6th, 2023, I guess. Um, what did I say? April 7th, 20, yeah. April 7th, 2023 is when this, I think will release. And then, um, I don't even know anymore. April 6th, (laughs) April 6th, 2023 is, uh, it's coming and it's the five year anniversary, uh, of that day. And I just wanted to, uh, 
um, you know, I will, obviously that day I'm, I'd like to put out something just to thank everybody once again. But um, yeah, it's, I mean, I've had a lot of conversations about grief in these last uh, couple of years, especially with people, you know, after my speaking engagements, I literally just had a conversation with a, an older gentleman. I finished his speech and you know, not a crazy amount of people there, you know, but it was a nice intimate crowd. And this, I would say probably 85 year old man came up to me and I have started implementing a speaking segment where it's, I just look at the crowd and I'm like, I'm now we're going to talk about grief because it's, it sucks to talk about sometimes, but I know that there is unfortunately a lot of people that can relate to grief and losing someone. And this 80 or 80, 85 year old man came up to me and um, he's in tears and he said, I recently just lost my wife to cancer and I just want you to know that men cry too. And he's like, grown men cry and you need to keep doing what you're doing. And I mean, it was, I, oof, awesome. my, my mom was right beside me and it's just, once again, I mean, I never thought I'd be relating to an 85 year old man that's lived a whole life about grief and about, you know, losing his significant other and even the speech before that. I talk a lot about about like birds and and bunnies just with the grief animal and you know people sometimes have their thing have their whether it is an animal whether it's a thing whether whatever it is people just will latch on to something I feel like in their grief journey and this gentleman came up to me after and he instantly said you know I lost my wife to cancer a year ago and my grief animal is dragonflies and butterflies and once again, I mean, we shared a hug and um, you could see the the emotion in his eyes. And it's just like it's you just never know. You just really mm -hmm. never know. And um, to relate it back to April 6, 2018 or to relate it back to, you know, the five year anniversary and obviously April 6, 2018, it's uh, it's been a crazy ride. It's been a it's been a wild journey. And um, I wish I had more answers for people, but I know that um, I just want to always touch on that. It's um, it's just so refreshing and amazing to still feel the love and support and to still. I was flying to Northern Ontario a couple months ago and I was wearing my humble hat and I'm getting on this plane and one of the flight attendants, you know, said, oh, you know, I've, I've ties to Leroy, which is just outside of Humboldt. And. Um, you know, and then we shared a, a pretty like short little intimate conversation after, you know, I shared who, what my background was. And it's once again, I mean, we're almost five years out and people are still recognizing it and people are still, mm -hmm. you know, wanting to help and, and people are still wanting to keep those legacies alive. And um, I think that's, uh, that's the most important thing. And that's, uh, you know, why I've started to appreciate this space more and more is, um it's not about comparing your stories. It's just about finding that common ground. And it's, um, I, I, once again, I just want to have, or just want to touch on the fact that I have so much love and appreciation and respect for the 16 families that, you know, lost a, a significant person in their life that day. And, and the fact that they're still going and the fact that they're creating these foundations, creating these scholarships, you know, promoting organ donation. It's just, it's miraculous to, to see the strength and to see their vulnerability and to see the fact that, you know, they just want to do everything in their power to, to keep their significant person's legacy alive and to, to do whatever they can to help and to do whatever they can to give back. And I know that I touch on this from time to time, but that's always something that really keeps me going and really motivates me to, you know, just, just do what I can. And I don't know if I'll be in this space for my whole life. I don't know if I'll be in this space for only one more year, but I know that, you know, not judging, or I think there's a quote that Joe Hawley said one time, and uh, he said, that's part of being present, not judging where you're at, but trusting that where you're at is exactly where you should be. And I think yeah. that's something that, uh, you know, I resonate quite heavily with. And uh, we're always left judging ourselves and always left, you know, with that self self doubt of we could be doing more and we could be doing this and that. And at the end of the day, I mean, just trusting the process and trusting that, you know, I think all those all those moments that you you talk about too, like it's that's kind of like it like when you step back and look at it, and like even like you can kind of tell when you talk about it how meaningful it is. Like those are some of the things that like are verifying that you're doing the right thing. You know, when these people come up to you and tell you these things that are that are like really important to them, and 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 those moments of you know like relatability, I guess like that's yeah. so important. And I think, yeah, I mean, just that 
yeah that raw pure connection that yeah. uh you know at times i think i think we're scared of connection at times because we want it to be that perfect connection but i mean just making that first initial connection is all that matters and then i mean it's just everything else after that is gravy everything else is uh you know being able to to work on yeah i uh i don't know i just wanted to touch on that and just wanted to say that, that you what's, know thank you what's one thing you've noticed from as the years go by year five like from yearly like to where you are now could be from like an individual standpoint like how you've grown and and not dealt with the situation but just like maybe lessons that you've learned as times as time has gone by one thing that sticks out to you or or multiple yeah that's um i i think honestly the one thing that comes to mind uh, right off the hop is you just like never know how you're gonna feel and I think even like with anniversaries, I always say this, but it's it's a lot about the anticipation, especially mm-hmm. like I remember the first anniversary, like I was just riddled with anxiety about the anticipation of it and like how I'm going to feel and like going about that day properly and making sure I'm, um, but I think this, I read a quote on Reddit, actually, Kat showed me this quote and it's from an old man that's lost a lot of people in his life. And I mean, he, he touches on how, when you first experience that grief, it's, you know, there's wreckage all around you, you're kind of drowning, everything is floating around you that reminds you of, you know, that relationship and that beauty and and the love that you endured. But then he also talks about, you know, the scars. I think that's something that a lot of people can relate to is just like that, how important it is to appreciate your scars and embrace those scars. And, and the fact of the matter is, those scars when they're so deep, and those emotional mental scars that are so deep that just shows shows the love that you had and the love that you had with that relationship with that person that you um who is unfortunately no longer here but then like on the other side of the coin there's a small comment on that same post and it talks about how you know if you don't initially feel wreckage and if you don't feel like you're initially drowning like that's okay too um i mean you just have to do what's best for you. And you have to understand that those waves will come at different times. And sometimes you just like, don't know how to possibly get through that. But I mean, just know that this is a process and this is a huge journey. And I mean, if it's dead calm right at the start of your grief journey, like that's okay too. Like that don't, don't put blame on yourself or don't put, you know, shame on yourself or, or don't, I know I did. I tried to force tears. Like, don't, you don't have to force mm-hmm. anything. You just have to, you know, let it come and and embrace it when you can. And I'm not saying that, you know, I'm going to fully embrace April 6, 2018, but I think to some respects, I'm going to fully embrace the scars that I now have and the relationship I have with my grief journey. And yeah, it's, it's just, yeah, it's fascinating to connect on, on grief mm-hmm. because of the fact that everybody's grief journey is so much different. Um, but at the end of the day, you just never know, you know, how you're going to feel. And, and I mean, being able to be in a good headspace, I'm not saying at all times, but being able to be in a good headspace and, and, you know, find your coping mechanisms and find, find that love and find that sacrifice is, um, yeah, I think that's probably the, the one big thing I've learned. So, yeah, yeah, no, that, that I mean, it's, it's fuck five years. Like it doesn't, to me, like it doesn't seem that. I guess that's how time flies, right? Five years is, that's a long, that's like, that's a long time ago, I guess. But to me, it doesn't seem like that long ago. So it's, uh, and you're doing such a good thing, man. Like you're creating something out of such a tragic thing that's helping other people along with, um, along with some of the other survivors too, right? So like it's, I think Joe, was it Jojo that said, we keep coming back to this quote (laughs) that Jojo said, but he had like a good uh, way of, of, talking about tragedy and, and coming out and doing something positive with it. So, um, and, and then the Morgan Wallen lyric kind of came to my head too, about like, if he didn't have all this stuff that happened to him, alcohol related incidents and stuff, it wouldn't have given him any lyrics for his, yeah. his song, you know? So it's just, I think you're doing a great thing and, and, uh, yeah, no, I, it's, uh, that's pretty crazy, man. Yeah. It's, uh, 
Yeah, time flies. Honestly, that's I think that's the best way to put it. It's uh, it's unfortunate because at times you just want time to just stop and pause and be able to, you know, fully engulf yourself in those moments. But it's impossible. And I think, uh, yeah, it goes back to that yeah, being present quote and and making sure that, you know, you're not constantly judging where you're currently at, but just having that trust and having that, you know, faith that, you know, things are going to work out. And it's been, you know, it's been hard, but I mean, it's uh it's going to get easier. And at times it's going to get a lot harder as well. So just, uh, mm-hmm. you know, finding what works for you, but, um, all right, well, let's finish on something. Um, yeah, I mean, we touched on a heavy topic and, you know, I, uh, let's finish on something light. Um, so you got anything that comes to mind? I, uh, I got Keisha and I were talking about like a good little segment we could do. And it was about nostalgia. Are you a nostalgic person? Ooh, yes. Very. Yeah. So we were just thinking about different, like, items or like we talked songs toys tv shows like all these kind of different things that like spark a memory but like a specific memory so like wow toy like toys like i loved lego when i was a little kid i I loved Lego. i had huge a bucket full i'd get the set i'd build the set and then break the set and put it into like this (laughs) huge huge uh, bucket and like lego to me like Saturday mornings in the summertime, my mom is a twin. Um, so her, my aunt would come over and they would go for a run, but my aunt would bring my two cousins, um, Daniel and Joey. Daniel's the best man at my wedding and we're, we're really close. And we would just play Lego nonstop the whole time. And then usually it was like a pool day or hot dog lunch, whatever. But Lego was a must in the morning. And I just remember one time we were playing up in my bedroom and we had those lights we call them boob lights you know like the they look like a boob oh yeah <laughs> and, yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> and, yeah yeah and uh i had this like basketball pillow it was just a ball but it was a basketball yeah. and it was a pillow and he threw it and it hit the light and the light just came down shattered and sliced his back and for, oh my for some reason, yeah like like not brutal but like bad enough where it's just ingrained in my memory <laughs> so we we're just talking about like nostalgic things and that took a dark turn my nostalgic <laughs> toy was lego and pogs i don't you might be too young for pogs but i'm looking like, this up right now what is a yeah, p-o-g-s yeah it's like a cult oh. toy kind of like beyblades you remember beyblades oh beyblades were legit man so beyblades were a little like were later and like more advanced but pogs yeah. were just like a, oh yeah yeah, well, I might. I don't know if I. I didn't ever fully get into the pog phase, but definitely Beyblades. Just let it rip. <laughs> uh, um, gosh, Lego was. Oh my gosh, the amount of times my mom probably stepped on Lego, and it. it oh, does it? Does anything else hurt as bad as stepping on Lego? No, not yeah, at it's all. Torture. I, um, Lego was massive. And we were a huge WWE fam. So nice. We the amount of rings and the amount of like little figurines we had, yeah, like yeah. jumping off the top ropes. We had an elimination chamber, like and every <laughs> time we went to Walmart, I would try and convince my mom to buy the seven dollar figurine because I didn't have that one. Well, I mean I had a three hundred at home. So um I would say yeah. Have? I was a big hardy like yeah. Hardy Brothers, uh, so Jeff and Matt Hardy. Um, I loved Randy Orton was kind of a kind of evil. Dot. I mean, Triple H was great. I was a big mm-hmm. Triple H guy. Yeah, that's a. Now I need to uh, like go back, and it's crazy. I'm now seeing like all these guys like come back into the WWE. Like John Cena just announced his like final retirement. Edge just came back. I think Jeez. I think Undertaker finally announced his retirement. Like I'm like you guys are like how old are you guys <laughs> yeah like and their I was, bodies are just oh, like broken down oh my god the amount brutal. of chairs and tables those guys have went through like no thanks yeah. man so yeah my i think dad, you see uh, my dad drove the undertaker once like my dad retired and he became a limo driver and he would take people from like buffalo to toronto or buffalo to niagara falls so comic-con was in niagara falls and he uh an undertaker was was going so my dad drove him from buffalo to niagara falls said he was the greatest guy like he's That's a sort of beast heard. though eh? he's like six yeah. nine like i think he played division one basketball same with and, kane uh, yeah are, are they 
brothers or cousins? Well, or... I, I don't know if that was like just a part. I think they're brothers. Just like I, 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 I can't remember if it was just a part of the show or if they're actually like in real life brothers. But I uh, I met Kane and like, wow, I can't fit through the door, man. <laughs> like, it just blows my mind. Imagine like fighting that. Like, imagine being Rey Mysterio or like, you know, little Eddie Guerrero and like having yeah. to fight six foot nine Kane or Undertaker. It's like, it's no, crazy. thanks. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, my parents wouldn't uh, they wouldn't let me watch wrestling um for like the violence or whatever when I was young. <laughs> so I'd always sneak over yeah. to my buddy, my, my good buddy Andrew Primo. We would always watch at his house. And he had the video games like N64 Ooh, yeah. or like yeah. NWO or WCW. Yeah. Stuff, so. Yeah. Like the um, real good days, like Mick Foley, like all those like old days. Yeah, yeah. yeah um yeah. yeah. Now that you, I, I would love to ask my parents why they let us watch it too, because we, we would kind of try and recreate it in our bedrooms and, and like, <laughs> you know, downstairs sometimes. And I'm sure it just led to tears. Yeah. But it was, uh, yeah, we went to, I probably went to four WWE shows growing up. Like they came to our gym the one time. Um, yeah. It, we would, you like, we used to have watch parties at our place and like rent wrestlemania and like make sure that like everybody's invited everybody's involved like it was just chaos but but yeah um we've covered a lot and if you're still with us uh thank you for the love thank you for uh for being a part of our fun little journey today uh we got a lot of fun guests lined up um it's busy times in both of our lives but uh we want to make sure that you know we're still being able to to create conversations with very like-minded but unique people. And I think that's uh, that's the beauty of this is, you know, as much as we we definitely want it to be in the sports space and we want to help break that stigma in the sports space. I mean, we're never limiting ourselves to involving uh, or bringing on people just in the counseling space or entrepreneur space or just anything. I think it's just that's the fascinating thing about this space and, and the mental health journey of of a lot of different people. So, um, yeah, we, uh, we appreciate you all and, uh, we hope you speak your mind today and yeah. Rouse. Yeah, no, it's a good way to end it. So we'll be back. Oh shit. We weren't recording. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> all right. Love y'all. Bye-bye. <laughs>